continuing through the Gospel of John and we're finishing up chapter 2. And so let me invite you to take out your Bibles and turn with me to John chapter 2. And our focus will be in verses 23 to 25. That's John chapter 2 verses 23 to 25. And that can be found on page 1055 of the Pew Bible in front of you. And as you turn there, let me say that I've titled this message, Entrusted with the Gospel. Yes, each and every confessing believer in Christ has been entrusted with something that the unbelievers will never be trusted with. Christ does not and will never entrust his gospel to unbelievers. And so when you see these charlatans on TV asking you for your money, but never sharing the gospel with you. Know this, the gospel has not been entrusted to them. No, they're charlatans, they're shysters, they're wolves pretending to be sheep. But for those who have bowed the knee to Christ, for all those who understand that they can only have salvation in his completed work, for all those, the gospel has been entrusted to you. And so let me invite you to rise as we read the infallible, inerrant word of the living God. The Apostle John writes this. Now when he, referring to Jesus, was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus on his part did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man for he himself knew what was in man. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, we praise you for your word. We praise you, O God, for how meticulous you were to preserve this gospel for us. And so, Father, we want to be equally meticulous as we go through it. We want for you, O oh God, to lead us according to your will this day. That as your word is read and as it is preached, O oh God, that you would impart upon our hearts the magnitude of it. And in the process, O oh God, we pray that you would be glorified. For we pray these things in Christ's holy name. Amen. You may be seated. How often throughout life do we ask ourselves, who are we? Sometimes we go through many days or even years not even really giving it much thought. Who are we? Sometimes rather than thinking, who are we? We, we kind of think to ourselves, where am I headed? What am I doing? What am I thinking? And we probably ask those types of questions more than, who are we? But we can answer every question, where am I headed? What am I doing? What am I thinking? Why do I do this? Why do I do that? If we first answer the question, who are we? Who are we? Who are we as human beings? I remember quite often, I, I pulled this picture. So it's, a, it's a scene from Manhattan, a busy scene somewhere around Times Square, right? And I remember when I used to work in the city, quite often I'd have my lunch outside and I'd be sitting on the steps of a building or maybe you know near the sidewalk and I'd just be watching people go back and forth, right? I wasn't saved or anything like that, but I was just thinking to myself, who are we as human beings? You see people walking from every different walk of life, but who are we? We see people with many different interests, but who are we? We see people with many different vocations, right? You, you sit in Manhattan, you'll see a homeless guy, you'll see an attorney, a doctor, you'll see a seamstress, you know, a, a worker in a deli. You'll see all these people walk by. But the real question is, who are we? Quite often we determine who we are based on our, our culture, right? Where I come from, the things that I like, or our race, our ethnicity, the communities that we live in, right? This is how we kind of determine who we are. 
But that's not who we are. And quite often we make distinctions about each other based on where we're from, based on what we do rather than who we are. When we think about who we are, sometimes we base our our feelings about who we are based on, on, on exterior things like our fashion, right? What do I like in terms of fashion? I'm a fashionista, right? Have you ever notice? you look at some of these models up on the screen there, right? They don't look very happy. It's, like, it's almost as if to be a model, you've got to be like, kind of like upset like You know? You just got to have just like a look like, oh, I really don't care. You know, look at me. You know, if you're a rock star, your hair's got to be inside, your shirt's got to kind of be ripped. You can be like, I don't care about anything. I just want to play my music, man. You know, and we think that that's def- that defines who we are. Sometimes we feel like we're only defined by our political affiliations. That's wrong. That's not who we are. Still, other people define themselves based on the latest social movement. I picked this one, not any of our recent ones. Why? Because social movements come and social movements what? Go. Go. Right? Here today, gone tomorrow. Popular today, unpopular tomorrow. And so if we base ourselves on the latest social movement or any of the other things that I mentioned, then we're short-sighted. We're short-sighted. Because the Bible teaches us something very different. And the reality is this, my friends. If we want to answer the question, who are we? We need to go to the word of God. Who created you? It was God. I have in front of me right here an iPad. If I have a problem with this iPad, it's made by Apple, I don't go to Samsung. I don't go to Microsoft. They're only going to mess it up. I go to Apple. And I'm not promoting Apple here. It just happens to be the one that I have. I know, Ken, you like HP. You like Microsoft, right? But if you have that product, you go to the manufacturer in order to fix it. And in like manner, in greater manner, you and I are created by God. That's exactly what the scriptures tell us, that we are made in the image of God. Therefore, if we want to answer the questions, who are we? That question, we should bring it to God. That question should be directed toward Scripture. Why? Because we are made in the image of God. And so only God knows us best. God knows us better than we know ourselves. Because we'll define ourselves based on our culture, based on our race, based on our ethnicity, based on the music we like or the entertainment that we like, based on how we dress, based on how we look on the outside. I remember my former church. I never used to talk about construction. I don't like talking about construction. In fact, I try to run away from talking about construction. But the way I dress, one day someone said, oh, I didn't know you were in construction. I thought you were like a bank manager or something like that. Isn't it? Okay, I may dress like that. But because, you know, whatever. This is the way I like to dress. I, I, I like, the, I like the, 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 I like to go to the thrift shop. I like to find suits at a great deal, six, seven dollars. I love that deal. I love shopping off of the clearance rack, right? I'm a clearance rack guy. That's the first rack I run to when I go in a store. So I'm not spending thousands of dollars, right? I'm actually spending hardly any money to try. I try to look as nice as I possibly can. But that's just me. But this doesn't determine who I am. And in fact, I can give you a false impression, right? You don't know I'm a carpenter. I can give you a false impression based on how I dress. And so how we dress, how we look externally, does not determine who we are internally. You see, while we look at each other, we see one thing. But how does God see us? Oh, that's a different thing. Right? When the Bible talks about humanity, it says this. Humanity has fallen into sin through Adam. Not a very good picture. Right? Humanity has fallen into sin through Adam. So God sees us. He sees us as people created in his image, right? But who have fallen into sin. God sees us as sinful. God sees us as being on the other side of the chasm, the chasm of sin. God sees us as separated from him because of sin. 
And without a bridge in that chasm, we will never be seen as righteous before God. And so we've got to go to the word of God if we want to understand who we are and how we get closer to God. I wrote here, listening to the teachings of the Bible will drive us closer to Christ and give us a greater understanding of ourselves. In other words, the more that we read the word of God, the more we read the gospel of Christ, the more we listen really carefully to what Jesus says or what is said about him, as we will in the verses before us today, the more we will grow closer to God, we'll understand who we are and we'll grow in our relationship in Christ. Which is also to say the opposite. The less we read the word of God, the less we will grow, the further we will be away from Christ and the further we will be away from our sanctification. You see, it works both ways. There's always the seen and the unseen when you're reading scripture. And we've got to understand that the opposites hold true. And so for every single confessing believer, our longing should be to read the word of God, to be drawn closer to God. And so knowing this, that it's the Bible, it's the word of God, it's the the ministry of Christ that tells us who we are, we should ask this question. What does Jesus say about humanity? What does Jesus say about humanity? You might say to yourself, well, he doesn't say a whole lot. No, no, he says quite a bit. He says quite a bit, and he's going to be speaking very boldly and loudly here as John is chronicling what Jesus was thinking. But it's important that we understand that in Scripture, there are things that are seen, and then there are some things that are unseen. And what I mean by that is this. It says, for by grace you have been saved. In other words, that's the scene. The unseen is, without grace, you will not be saved. And we're going to see that today in the verses before us. And so understanding that there there are things that are seen and things that are unseen in Scripture, we as confessing believers have got to learn to look below the surface. What is Christ trying to tell us? What are the apostles trying to tell us? What What contrasts are we seeing here? How is God trying to open our eyes and our understanding to who we are and how we must think and live. Well, let me be very upfront. Let me show you the scene, first of all. What we're going to see in the verses before us today is because of signs, people believed in Jesus' name. That's the first thing we're going to see. The second thing that we're going to see is Jesus did not trust in the people who believed. So they claim to believe, and Jesus says, but I don't trust you. Right? Now, that sounds kind of odd, right? We say, oh, we're Christians. We're supposed to trust people. Give them the benefit of the doubt. No, Jesus is saying here, no, I don't trust you. I don't trust in your belief. And the unseen is the why. And then we'll see that <laughs> Jesus was reading the hearts of the people. Right? And so we see things on the surface. We say, you know, Jesus is doing all these miracles. They believe. Yay, praise be to God. No, Jesus is saying, no, no, no. I don't trust in that. That is, that is spurious at best. I don't trust in that, and I'm going to tell you why I don't trust in that. And so, as we look below the surface, we've got to ask ourselves, what is below the surface? What, is, what else is Jesus trying to tell us here? What is this gospel trying to tell us? Well, this gospel is going to teach us some doctrine. Ready? I know you came here like, oh man, I hope he uses that word. Right? It's a word that really people don't like very often because it seems very kind of theologically cryptic, right? But in here, we are going to see some doctrine, the doctrine of radical corruption. And I don't know if you remember, but that word doctrine is not such a big word. It simply means the teaching, the teaching of radical corruption. That's the first thing we're going to see. And you can say, so wait a minute, radical corruption, when we think of that, we quite often think about the bad guys, right? We think about the mob and, and this and that. They're the bad guys. They're the ones that are corrupt, right? Not us. We're good people. No, oh, wait a second. Let me explain what radical corruption is. You see, we have a heart. And there's something at the core of our heart. And the Bible tells us that that something is sin. 
It's at our core. It's at our radix. That's why we call it radical corruption. There's something radical at the core of our hearts. In other words, not necessarily our physical heart, but at the heart of our intentions. There is something in there that makes us radically corrupt. The Bible teaches this. And I'm going to tell you right off the bat, right off the bat, this is why Jesus didn't trust in them. Because he knows the heart. And he knows the heart is radically corrupt. How so? We seek our likes first. Jesus can get my everything else after I'm comfortable, after I'm happy. God can have all of me just after I take care of myself. Right? That's how we think. That's how humans think. It's us first. And the Bible teaches that this is radical corruption. But God is good. And so in these verses, we're also going to see the unseen, that there's a doctrine of divine adoption, right? That is where God divinely reaches into our lives and adopts us as his children. What does the Bible say we we are before Christ saves us? We are children of wrath. But when God comes and saves us, we become children of God. We know that this is the case because the scriptures speak about it. Only God has the power or the will to save us. We do not have the will to save ourselves. No, our will seeks other things all the time. Our heart chases everything else but God all the time. Listen to what Paul speaks about in Romans chapter 9, verses 15 and 16. He says this. For he says to Moses, and he's recalling what God said to Moses in the book of Exodus, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. And so then Paul surmises, he says, so then, it, the it refers to God's compassion, God's mercy, God's salvation. It depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy, right? And so if we are going to be saved, it is only going to happen by God. And in Galatians 3, verse 26, Paul writes this. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. Now let's read the unseen here. For without Jesus, you are not sons of God and you have no faith. You get it? And that's why we know that people need Jesus. That's why when I go to share the gospel with someone, I can't tell them that Jesus is going to give them a better life. He's going to give them a better job. He's going to make things all great with their marriage. No, because that's nonsense. Because Jesus may not choose that. But what Jesus will give you is eternal life in his name. What Jesus does offer you is forgiveness of all your sins, past, present, and future. That's what Jesus will give you. He will give you faith to follow him through the difficult times and through the easy times. But without Jesus, you have nothing. And you have nothing that God wants because you don't have faith. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. Try as you might, it is impossible to please God. Finally, in these verses, we're going to see the doctrine of saving faith. Again, faith in faith is nothing at all. But faith that has been gifted to us is of God. And it's everything. That's why I put here, saving faith is a sovereign gift from God alone. And so clearly we can begin to surmise, I guess these people who believed in Jesus believed in something else. They didn't have a saving faith. This is why Jesus did not entrust himself to them. You see, when we begin to understand the word of God that way, then we can begin to understand our friends and our family members who claim to have faith, but don't live it out. Jesus has not entrusted his gospel to them. That's why they have a fake faith, a counterfeit faith. That's why when we see preachers preaching about everything else except for the gospel, we can say they have no faith whatsoever. It has not been gifted to them. They are only preaching 
what would fill their bellies. They're only preaching what brings them adoration, the adoration of man. They're only preaching what brings them the accolades of mankind. And so here we see that, and we will see in these verses, that saving faith is the only faith that counts. Amen. And I just said that we only get it through God. Mm-hmm. And we're also going to see something else here. It's kind of on the fringe, but we see it nonetheless. That regeneration precedes faith. In other words, you must be born again before you can have faith. And sometimes we don't even realize, I know that night, I, did not, I was not born again. Until, I, I did not have faith until I was born again. That night that I accepted Christ as my Savior and Lord. That night, as the gospel was being shared with me, it, I felt as if something was opening my heart. Now I know it was the Spirit of God opening my heart to believe. I didn't believe before I rang that doorbell, but I certainly believed as I was leaving that house. I believed because the Spirit had opened my heart to believe. And from there came my faith. You cannot have faith in God and then believe. You believe first and that belief is a gift and you are regenerate. And then you have faith. And we'll see that in these verses before us today. You cannot have faith in Christ if you have not been born again. And in fact... Jesus is going to teach us to Nicodemus in the very next chapter. He say, unless a person be born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus doesn't even ask him that question, but Jesus goes right there. Because he's saying, it doesn't matter how great of a teacher you are of the faith. If you have not been born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. And we see the biblical evidence of these things in this. I want to share with you John chapter 6, verses 63 to 65. In these verses, we have Jesus who has just, been, who has just finished feeding thousands of people. And Jesus has gone away. He's gone to another side of the river. And the people are looking for him. They're frantic looking for him all over the place. And they jump into a boat and they come after Jesus. Right? And you would think that this is a good following, right? Any pastor would say, wow, this is a great following. I'm preaching. People are coming. They're following. They want more. They want more. They want more. No, Jesus is looking into their hearts. So here's what happens. It says here, Jesus says to them, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words I have spoken to you are spirit and life. And those are all gathered around Jesus. They're waiting for him to say something else. And he tells them, it's only the spirit that gives life. The flesh, what you're doing, what you want, it's of no help at all. He says, the words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But there are some of you who do not believe, he said to them. And it says here, for he knew, for Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe and those who would betray him. And then he says this to them in verse 65. And he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted to him by the Father. Right? You can come and you can chase me down all you want. You can think I'm the rock star of the age. But you know what? If the Father doesn't grant it to you to believe, if he doesn't gift it to you, you will not have saving faith. True saving faith is a gift from God. And again, without faith, it is impossible to please God. And so let's look at the verses before us this morning. Verse 23 Shows us that believing because of signs and wonders is not the same as surrendering your heart. Right? There's a big difference there. They may believe because they've seen something miraculous. Right? But it's not the same as surrendering your heart. Surrendering your heart to Christ is an act of saving faith. And so it's important for us to understand as well because when we're sharing the gospel with some of our well-meaning friends and they say, yeah, I get it. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, it makes sense. But they still don't believe. It's because it has not yet been gifted to them. And we don't really tell them that, but we know that. And so we keep on pressing forward trying to lead them on to Christ because we know that when the gospel is shared, it's not just for the person that it's shared to, but it's also for the person who's doing the sharing, right? 
I'm pretty sure that Joe, that night, when he led me to Christ, him and his wife were edified as they led me to Christ. And so you see, God is working in both situations, the one who's sharing and the one who is receiving. And so as we share the gospel, it's important for us to keep that in mind. So it says here, now he, when he was in Jerusalem at Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. This is the third time that we hear of Jesus performing signs. The first was at the wedding feast in Cana, right? We see that he turned water into wine. The second is when he comes into the temple and he begins to cleanse the temple, right? He begins to show that he is the authority over the temple. He begins to do things that no one else has ever done. He's quoting scripture. He's saying that, and, and, and the apostles are seeing this, and they're saying that they're recognizing that Jesus is fulfilling that which, which David felt in his own heart. Zeal for my father's house will consume me. Right? And Jesus didn't end there. Obviously, from these verses, he's performing many other miracles throughout the entire week of the feast. Can you imagine being there? Can you imagine having waited so long for the Messiah to come, believing that the Messiah was going to liberate your country, liberate your people, and seeing all these things happening? Yeah, you would probably claim to believe as well. And they believed, why? Because they saw signs of what he was doing. Seeing is not always believing. So why does Jesus perform these signs? Well, signs, are, are, are signs and wonders are to authenticate the authority of the person performing them. The authority of the one performing them. Jesus is saying, yes, I am the Messiah. But notice this, that because he is performing these signs, he doesn't need the people to agree that he is the Messiah. The signs in and of themselves show his authority, show his authentication. But they're also there for another reason. And the reason is to strengthen true saving faith. So if the people weren't believing, who do you think was? Who do you think was being strengthened? Well, it had to be the disciples who were with him. It had to be them that were being strengthened. And they were going to need that strength. Why? Because they were later going to face persecution. They were later going to be scared and want to run from their lives because they did not want to get crucified as their Lord did. So they're going to need to be strengthened. And this is what Jesus is doing here. He's building their strength little by little and he's broadening his ministry. And he's also teaching us something here as well. That we cannot believe unless we are saved. You know, people say it all the time. You know, if, if God were to come down right now, I would believe, right? If, if Jesus were to open the clouds and yell down and say, yo, I'm real, believe in me, I would believe. It's nonsense. What did Jesus say when he spoke about the, the rich man and Lazarus? La the, the rich man says, can you send Lazarus back to warn my brothers and my father that they may not end up here? He says, no, they have the prophets, right? They have the prophets, they got the word of God. They've got all of that. If they will not believe that, they will not believe someone who comes back from the dead. And that was a foreshadowing of Christ coming back from the dead. Yeah, he rose from the dead. Thousands of people saw it. Did anyone believe because of that? No. They believed because it was gifted to them in the Holy Spirit. And so in and of themselves, signs and wonders do not create saving faith. And I say this because, you know, a lot of times we point to these things when we're trying to share the gospel. Or we point to these things to try to, 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 to make ourselves believe more in Christ. But belief comes first. And then confirmation of that belief can be found in these things. People sit in worship services all the time. And they hear about Jesus turning water into wine. Walking on water. They hear, they hear about him calming the sea. But they walk out of there and say, yeah, that was a nice story. No, thank you. And so in and of themselves, signs and wonders do not create saving faith. The only way we have saving faith is when it is gifted to us by the Holy Spirit. So if the people weren't believing in Jesus as Savior and Lord, what were they actually believing in? 
Well, we've got to ask ourselves that, right? What were the times? What was going on during those times? Well, as they see Jesus doing all these things, what do they want him to do? They want him to lift them out of the Roman rule. They want him to conquer their enemies. Think of this, right? It's sort of, it's as if they are looking at Jesus as their modern day Goliath. You remember what the, you remember what the Philistines did? They took Goliath and they sent him out in front of the rest of their army to stand for them. And Goliath was slaying all the other armies. The, the majority of the Philistines didn't have to do a whole lot. They just stood behind Goliath. In fact, they, tell, they basically say, you know, bring your strongest guy to fight our strongest guy. And if he wins, we'll surrender. And this is kind of what the Jews want from Jesus. They want him to be their Goliath. But that's not who Jesus is. That wasn't his mission. But that's what they're believing in. That's what they want. What else do they want? Well, they want to be a sovereign nation again. They don't want to have anyone's foot on their neck. And what else do they want? Well, they don't want to pay the emperor's tax. They're sick of paying taxes. In fact, when Jesus comes into the, to, to the, to the, to the temple the, for the last time, the week of his, of his crucifixion, right? What do they do to him? They want to try to trip him up with taxes. They, they ask him in Matthew chapter 21, verses 15 to 21. It says, then the Pharisees went and plotted how to entangle him in his words. And they sent their disciples to him, to Jesus, along with the Herodians saying, teacher, we know that you are true, a true teacher, the way um, and you teach the way of God truthfully. Right. So they're beginning to kind of set him up. You treat you teach the way of God truthfully and you do not care about anyone's opinion. They're kind of buttering him up here. Right. They're getting him ready for the fall. And they say to him, for you are not swayed by appearances. We can tell you look deep within a person. Tell us then, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Now, remember where they are. They're at the temple. And there's not only the temple guard, but there's some Roman guards. They're making sure that nothing's going on. And they're all kind of leaning in. What is he going to say? Is this guy going to create an uprise telling us not to pay the emperor's tax? And if Jesus goes along with that, he's going to be arrested by the Romans. But if he doesn't go along with that, then the Jews are going to be mad at him. Jesus is in where we would call a rock in a hard place, right? But just when they think they got Jesus on the hook, Jesus jumps up and swallows them, swallows the boat, swallows the fishing rod and everything else. And Jesus says to them, why put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. And Jesus said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? And they said to him, Caesar's. Then he said to them, Therefore, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. He said, you are so focused on this life. You're so focused on the subjugation of the, of the Romans. You're so focused on what you don't have or what you do have or what someone has taken from you that you can't even see what your real need is. Your need is to submit yourself to God. You're so focused on the temporal need that the eternal need is passing you by. The eternal need is going over your head. You're so focused on what you want rather than what I am here to give you. And isn't that how we are sometimes as well? We want Jesus for so many different things. And so we've got to ask ourselves, why do we want Jesus? I ask you today, why do you want Jesus? And each and every one of us may answer that differently. But the reality is this. We should say we want Jesus because we know we need salvation. We want Jesus because we know that we're sinful. We want Jesus because we know that we can't save ourselves. We want Jesus because we want to be in the family of God. We want Jesus because this life holds nothing for us. And we want to be focused on eternity. Think about that. Why do you want Jesus as we go into the next verses? Verse 24 says, 
or I should say verse 24 shows us that many believed in Jesus' name, but he didn't believe in their faith. It says here, but Jesus on his part did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people. This is what we call here, the, these two verses are kind of like a, a Greek parallelism. And it's kind of a, a, a very thoughtful and methodical way of thinking. And here's how to break it down. It's basically this. The people believed in Jesus' name, but Jesus didn't believe in them. Right? And, and it's telling us something there. That Jesus was not fooled by their spurious belief. He wasn't fooled by their counterfeit faith. Jesus would continue to press on because he knew that they knew that, that they did not know what they needed. They claimed to believe in him, but he would not entrust his authentication to their faithlessness. But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them. Jesus was not concerned to get their likes. He wasn't waiting for them to kind of say, Yay, Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah. Let's lift him up on our shoulder for he's a jolly good fellow. He wasn't waiting for that. Nor did he need it. John 8 verse 18 tells us that Jesus said this, I am the one who bears witness about myself and my father who sent me bears witness about me. Jesus says, my father bears witness about me. I don't need your accolades. I don't need your adulation, right? I don't need any of that. And sometimes we go throughout life and we feel like we need for people to affirm us. That's a big thing, right? Oh, I just want to affirm you and what you're doing and this and that. You ever notice that when people are affirming other people, they're always, affir the majority of the time are affirming them in sin, right? No, Jesus doesn't need any of that. He does not need for us to affirm him. If we don't proclaim his name, the rocks will cry out his, his glories. Right? But Jesus wants for the believers, the true believers, to proclaim him. To be like his father and to say, yes, this is the son of God. Notice he didn't say anything against John when John said it about him. No, because he knew that saving faith had been gifted to John. And when the disciples said it about him, he didn't say, no, 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 I don't trust you. No, but here he says that. He says, because the people want something else from me. Why does he say this? Because he knows all people. Yes, Jesus knows you. Jesus knows your likes and he knows your dislikes. He knows why you came here today or the people who didn't come here, he knows why they didn't come here today, right? Whether it's something good or something not good. He knows exactly why we do what we do. And it's important for us to remember that because we can't hide from Christ, nor should we want to. We want to grow in Christ, so we've got to be truly honest with the Lord Jesus Christ. We can't hide behind what we want to be. We've got to be faithful and honest with who we are in Christ, because he knows the motives of our hearts. He knows what makes us tick, beloved, and praise be to God for that. Because then that's one person that we can truly be honest with. I mean, we should be honest with all people. But above all people, we need to be honest with Christ. And so I ask you, what is in your heart? This is something that we struggle with all the time. It's something that we probably even really don't like to talk much about, right? We don't like to talk about it because sometimes if we're honest... You know, godly things are not on our heart. In fact, maybe more times than we like to confess, ungodly things are on our heart. But Christ calls us to look at that because he knows what is inside of man. What's important to you? And it's important for us to align our will, our desires, our motivations with the word of God. Because that's the only thing that changes it. Outside of the word of God, we're stuck in our selfishness. We're stuck in our sinfulness. And no matter how hard we try, we can't shake our sin nature. 
So I say here, God knows you better than you know yourself. And sometimes we try to hide behind who we are. Sometimes we, we put on a good face, right? We dress up nicely. We say to ourselves, you know, people get a, we want to, we want to portray a good image. We want to put our best foot forward. We go for a job interview, we put on our best clothes, right? We don't go in there, we tell them, listen, I'm an embezzler. And so I come in here today with my cufflinks and everything. I want you to think I'm a great guy, but let me get in there and I'm going to rip you off. We never say that, right? We never say that I'm a backbiter. We never say that, hey, listen, you know what? I'm married. I got kids and stuff, but I'm looking for an affair. So if you get me into this job, I'm going to find the cutest, hottest secretary, and I'm going to try to have an affair with her. We don't say those things, right? We kind of hide behind how we look, how we present ourselves, the way we speak, the things that we claim to like and dislike, right? We hide behind that. But God sees what is hidden. And we can't fool ourselves. God sees exactly what is hidden? I mean, you look at this, right? I'm dressed. I got a pretty nice suit on and everything, nice dress shirt and everything like that, right? But as we take off our, our jackets, as we look a little bit deeper, right? What do we see? Well, we see, you know what? There's sometimes things that we are hiding about ourselves, right? Maybe boastful or godless. Right? People really look at us, right? They may see that we're sinners, that we're hateful, that we're lustful. You know, we can, we can put on a good presentation all we want. We can always try to put our best foot forward. But the reality is that no matter how hard we try to act holy, there's always holes in our holiness. There's always holes in our holiness. Right? <laughs> And, you know, my wife sits there and says, those are going in the garbage, right? But sometimes we want to hold on to our holiness, right? We don't want to let it go. We want to act like everything is all right, but everything's not all right, right? And we may hide to the, to, to, to the public, but there's no hiding from God. And Jesus is telling us here that he sees who we are. He knows who we are. So stop hiding and start professing. Stop and start professing about who we are. Because then is when God will begin to work in us. Because he says, you want to be boastful? I'm going to let you hold on to it. You want to be a liar? I'm going to let you get caught up in it. You want to continue to act sinful? I'm going to let you deal with the weight of that sin. With the gravity of that sin. We've all been there. We've experienced it. We've all gotten caught up in our own messes. God is saying, don't act like you don't know that I know. And this is what Jesus is telling us in these verses. Which brings us to verse 25. Verse 25, in verse 25, Jesus didn't need to figure out who was real and who was fake, for he knows the intentions of our hearts. It says here, and he needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. Yes, Jesus knows every single part of us. For he himself knew what was in man. This is the whole reason why he came. Because he came to save us from us. You see, as I said earlier, we look at the outside, but God looks at the inside. You remember when uh, David, when Samuel was going out to look for the next king to anoint him, right? What does God say? He says, listen, it's not the guy you think it's going to be. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks at the outward appearances, but the Lord looks on the heart. And so the Apostle Paul understands this to such a great degree that he writes these words about who we are. He says, as it is written, and he's quoting from the Psalms, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Now you tell that to an unbeliever and they say, that's why I'm not a Christian. 
Because everyone is good. People are basically good. That's why when I hear Joel Osteen saying, you know, people are basically good. I don't preach about sin because people are basically good. They can get that in any other church. I I don't want to bring people down. I want to lift them up. Well, then if that's the case, then call Paul a downer. Call Paul a downer. Because we need to know who we are in order to understand why we need to be saved. And the power of that salvation. But Paul goes on. He goes on to tell us exactly who we are. He says here in verse 13, their throat is an open grave and they use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps or snakes is under their lips, right? Look at all the deception that's going on in the world. Look at how people are, are backbiters towards one another. How they speak venomous things to destroy other people's life. Yes, the Bible is true. This is who we are as human beings. But it gets even worse. He says their mouth is full of curse. Curses and bitterness. The other day I was in Home Depot. And I was there at the register. And there was this guy having a conversation with somebody. Um, blank and this and blank and that and that mother blanker and this and that. And I'm like, oh my goodness, man. There's women and children here. There's, what is this? Is this a bar? Is it, it was disgusting. But that's what we do. And we become so just, just comfortable with it that we use it in casual conversation. The F-bomb becomes filler for our sentences. And we give no care about it. Yeah, their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Start thinking about the world as you're hearing these verses. Let's go on. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and ministry. From the moment that that Cain killed his brother Abel because of envy, we have continued to destroy humanity. You think about the atrocities in the the Holocaust and, and so many other wars and things that have happened over life. Yes, this is who we are as human beings. There is nothing redeemable about us. But it gets worse. And the way of peace they have not known. Hiroshima, Nagasaki, riots in the streets. And it goes on and on. And it will continue to go on and on until the Lord Jesus Christ returns. This is why we've got to say to ourselves, people need Jesus. I, you, we need to grow in the wisdom and the knowledge of the word of God. That we may spread the gospel. That more and more people would come to know Christ. Come to submit to him as Lord. Come to shed their their evil, their wickedness. And to pick up the word of God. He says here in verse 18. There is no fear of God before their eyes. I had a fellow who used to work with me. He says, yeah, when I get to hell, I'm going to kick Satan off his throne. I'm going to I'm going to rule around here. You have no idea what hell is like. Satan does not rule in hell. No, you're all under the wrath of God. And what does the Bible say? It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a wrathful God. But there's no fear of that. Consequences, consequences. as long as I can do whatever I want to do. And that's how people live out their life. So again, Jesus says here, there was no need, or I should say, um, John writes about what Jesus was thinking. And Jesus needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. Again, Jesus does not need the accolades of unbelievers. But... But but Jesus does require the faithfulness of those whom he has saved. That's you. That's you, beloved. Jesus would not entrust his ministry, his gospel, his, his authentication to the unbelievers, but he has entrusted it to you. He's entrusted it to me. He's entrusted it to us Because he has gifted us faith. Faith in him. And we are to do something with this. Look at um, what's written in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 4. We, that is the believers in Christ, that is the saved in Christ, we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. So we speak not to please man, not a social gospel, not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. Which is to say, it is going to be difficult 
to fulfill this ministry that God has entrusted you with. But God is doing this to test you. And in testing you, he will sanctify you. And in sanctifying you, he will, he will open your heart, expand your heart to love him more, to know him more. That many more people will come to know his son through you. Beloved, we have been entrusted with the gospel. God is taking our depraved hearts. He has taken our depraved hearts and he's made them hearts of flesh. He has sovereignly regenerated our hearts and he has entrusted us with the faith, the faith of the gospel that once and for all has been delivered to his people. Therefore, we are called to stand firm in this faith, not to please man, but to please God. And before we can share that gospel, that faith with anyone else, we've got to continue to share it with ourselves. We've got to tell ourselves, God knows me. Lord, change me. Lead me. Lead me, Father, because you know what? I'm not a forgiving person. I don't like to ask for forgiveness, and I don't like to give forgiveness. Lead me, O oh God, because I'm a liar. Lead me, O oh God, because I'm boastful. You fill in the blanks as you see fit, right? Lead me, God, for you have entrusted me with the gospel of your son. Praise be to God, beloved. Amen? Amen. Amen. Would you pray with me? Our holy Father and glorious God, we come before you this day, Father, and we thank you for entrusting us with the gospel of salvation. We thank you, Lord God, for entrusting us with your son's mission. We thank you, O oh God, for entrusting us with your word. And so, Father, we pray that we would use your word. We pray that you would, we would apply your word. And we pray that we would grow in your word. That we may faithfully live out this life of Christ, this life in Christ. Father, we pray that through all of this, that Christ would be magnified in our lives and that others would come to know him as Savior and Lord. Help us to know you more, O oh God, to love you more, that we may know ourselves. And Father, would you be glorified in this? For we pray these things in Christ's holy name. Amen.